So today we'll talk about vanity. Now vanity is a very, very common fault. It's a rare person that does not have some vanity in him. That's how common it is. And so pay attention. It is especially dangerous for priests because priests have the esteem of the lay people in general, not always, but in general they do. So people say nice things to you and compliment you and what a wonderful sermon you gave and you know, I, I like the way you sing the preface and so forth. <laughs> All right, so you're in a position of uh, fame, you might say, at least uh, you, you're a big fish in a small pond. You, 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 people look up to you. So that's, that feeds vanity. So you have to be very careful. Now, uh, distinguish pride from vanity. Pride is far more general than vanity. If you recall, I told you there are three levels of pride. The first is vanity. The second is the pride of selfishness. And the third is the pride of arrogance or, and or rebellion. All right, so this is the lowest form of pride. So pride is defined as excessive love of self or excessive pleasure taken in one's own excellence. That's pride in general. So pride in general consists in regarding oneself as one's first principle and last end. First principle in as much as it is a failure to attribute to God the perfections which are given to us by him. See, St. Teresa said humility is truth. So it's not pride to say, I'm good at this or I'm good at that, if you are. Just as when truth told me that he's good at playing tennis. If he is, you know, I don't know if he is or not. <laughs> but he thinks he is. And last end, that is, uh, it, it, pride orders all things to ourselves as if we were, uh, as if we alone and not God and not our neighbor should be pleased. So we become a little God that has to be pleased. Everything must pertain to us and must in some way enhance us. So that's pride in general. Now, vainglory or vanity, that's the same thing, proceeds from pride. And it is defined as an inordinate esteem for the love of others. It is not wrong to want others to esteem your qualities or your virtues if such esteem is sought for the glory of God. So to give good example, you would hope that others would see your good example and emulate it. That's not vanity. For example, that an artist would want his students to esteem his, his ability in order that they become good artists. That's not vanity. If he knows he's good, and it's true, that's not vanity. Or that a superior would want his subjects to uh, esteem his virtue for the sake of good example. That's not vanity. As long as everything is true, <laughs> inordinate esteem however does not seek the end of the glory of God but the glory of oneself 
So there's an ordered esteem and then a disordered esteem. And that's where the sin is. Just as there is an ordered anger and a disordered anger. Vainglory may also consist in seeking esteem for vain things, that is, things which are not worthy of esteem. For example, to drive a beautiful car. There's a lot of vainglory in that stuff. You know, <laughs> very typically, you know, to especially sports cars or uh, impractical cars. A car is meant to drag yourself around from place to place, essentially. It's like a horse in a carriage. And they couldn't do much with horses and carriage except for kings and whatnot. But, I mean, most people just had an ordinary horse and carriage. The horse looked the same and the carriage looked the same as everybody else's. But then when cars came along, well, that was a different thing. See, the purpose of it is to drag you around to different places. So it should be in accordance with that and accordance with your state in life. In other words, uh, just like your, your home, you know, if you're, uh, you know, should be in accordance with your state in life. The, the bishop of the diocese should not live in a shack, you know, or in a cave. See, it's in accordance with his state in life that he live in a nice home because that, that reflects nothing else but his state. See, so the bishop's house, you know, the, the should be something impressive. So, you know, the, you know, somebody in a higher state of life, for example, lawyer, doctor, somebody, you know, that is a dignitary uh, in some way in, in the levels of society should manifest that by their home, their car, etc. That's completely in accordance with reason. But to go beyond that, just for the sake of showing off, is vanity. So you're, it's a vain thing. I mean, you don't need uh, a fancy sports car to drag you around. It's a, you know, and usually those things are done for vanity's sake. Whenever I drive, I notice that the people who have the fastest cars drive slowly. Do you ever notice that? The people who could go 120 miles an hour, no problem, are always driving slowly. And you have to pass them. They, they have these cars that could go so fast. It's, it's, it's a vanity car. So that's just an example of a something stupid about which to be vain. Or to wear clothing which is showy. That's why you wear a uniform, so as not to be showy. That's why you wear black, so as not to be showy. But it does show your your position too, your clerical position, but it, it's, that's why you, you give up ordinary clothing. That's why the Novus Ordo has gone back to ordinary clothing and secular clothes for, for clergy. Practically none of them wear a Roman collar, practically none, except for special occasions. And they all look like slobs. They do. Or uh, clothing that is too expensive, it's over your head and or beyond one's state in life. To wear one's hair in an odd way. Right? That's why you have 
short hair and so you don't wear it in an odd way. But you see, you know, people like men with hair down to their shoulders or something like that. That's all vanity. And it's vanity about a stupid thing. It's so people look at them. It's like taking your muffler off your car so that your car sounds loud. See, that means you're an important person and everyone should look at you as you go by. That's vanity. It's vain about a dumb thing, a stupid thing. In short, anything that is used for the purpose of attracting attention to oneself is vainglorious. The way you speak, if you speak with some sort of odd accent. Like people putting on British accents. Americans putting on British accents. But you can always tell because they always fall down on the O. Always listen for that. You say British, we say, British say God. That O is O. Americans say God. That short O, that's a short O because it's between two consonants, that becomes A. It also becomes A in Russian. A short O in Russian becomes, becomes A. So, for example, the, and this is totally off the subject, but the way you say Moscow in Russian is is done this way. I, you know, of course, in Russian lettering, but you would say that's Moskva. No, it's Moskva because the accent is here, so it's Moskva. Yes, that's from the Russians themselves. So that's true of English and American, uh, American English. Uh, but so when, when Americans are putting on some sort of stupid accent, always listen for that O because that gives them away. Right. <laughs> uh, vainglory may also consist in seeking the esteem of those whose judgment is worthless. Thus, the vain dress for the vain. It's very true of women. They dress more for each other than for men. Put on all sorts of things so that actually other women will notice how well dressed they are. It's typical of women. But men do it too. Teenagers typically dress and act in a manner that is slavish to vanity in order that they might receive the praise of other teenagers who are slaves to the same vice. It's a rare teenager that rises above that. You see the way public school children dress or whatever you want to call it. They all look like slobs in the same way. You know, it's, it's like a uniform. It's this slobbish uniform. So, what is the malice of vainglory? Vainglory can be either a mortal sin or a venial sin. It is seldom mortal. To be vain, however, about a serious fault or sin would be a mortal sin. So to brag about, uh, for example, uh, women that you have seduced is a mortal sin. And men do that all the time. So to brag about some mortal sin that you have committed, robbing a bank or some other that's, that's a mortal sin to do that. But usually, it, you know, is, especially for pious people, they don't do that. But they nonetheless have, you know, almost everybody's got a, some vanity in them. 
So vanity is usually venial, however, when it concerns our appearance or the way we speak or the way we dress or any other way in which we seek to show off. Show off, that's English for be ostentatious. But even in this venial form, it can have devastating effects and can lead to mortal sin indirectly. And this is why. Vain people become slaves of praise, of the praise which they seek. Once that vanity sets in, it tends to take you over. You're constantly looking for praise and attention. So it gets into sort of all of the pores of your body. You know, everything you're thinking about, everything, you know, it, it, and it, it takes root. And therefore they become slaves of those persons who pay them compliments. And, or from whom they seek compliments. So they will do anything practically for those compliments. That's where it becomes very dangerous. This slavery can lead them to shameful acts. Not because they desire to commit such sins in themselves, but because of the fear of losing the esteem of others. They go along. Bad friends. You know, if you don't go along with what we're doing, you're not one of the gang. You're not one of our friends. And many, uh, having bad friends is one of the biggest occasions of sin. And it's very prevalent among young people, but it's also prevalent among older people too. How will I be esteemed? How will people look at me if I don't do this? Very common source of sin. And they would not have sinned otherwise, except for their vanity. In other words, they're drawn into a, a greater sin because of their vanity. Their vanity might be venial in itself, but because they're constantly seeking acceptance and compliments and praise and they want to go along and be part of you know, the, whatever group they're in, they sin. Now, these are the sins which flow from vainglory. The first is boasting. Some do this openly and even amusingly to others. So some people are just blowhards, as we say in English. They talk about themselves constantly, things about the, that they've done. They almost always are exaggerators. It's, it's one of the signs of vanity is exaggeration. So we boast about ourselves when uh, we talk about ourselves, and this includes our family members, our children, you don't have any children. Grandchildren, you don't have those. Cars, pets, schools, sports activities, accomplishments, abilities, talents. Now, there might be reason to talk about yourself with regard to those things. 
that's not vanity. But if you do that without a good reason, you're as vain as a peacock. <clears throat> I may have told you this, but I was on a plane once sitting toward the back and this woman gets up and is and preaches to us about the accomplishments of her like 13 year old daughter sitting there about how she came in third place in some sort of track competition. Third place. I mean, you know, she didn't come in. She didn't win it. And how she's going to go to Harvard. She gets up in the aisle and preaches to all of us in the back about her daughter who's sitting right there. I mean, I, it was almost a cause of pity for me that this woman looked so stupid that, that we, you know, she would sub subject all of us. We don't care about her daughter, frankly. You know, that's what I felt like saying to her. I couldn't care less about your daughter, what she does or what she wins or anything like that. Why don't you just sit down? Like they say in the English Parliament. Oh, that is so funny to watch the House of Commons. That's rubbish. Just sit down. They say this to the Prime Minister, you know, and, you know, and others that get up and <laughs> things that would never happen in the U.S. Congress. But it's, it's if you see it on C-SPAN, you see the they just run, you know, the House of Commons. It's so funny. Oh gosh. And, and you know, they just. Uh, but anyway, that's what she did. Uh, just let me finish. This is not too much more. Uh, so the, uh, or it typically, now you wouldn't do this, on, well, you never know, uh, showing pictures of our children or grandchildren. That's so common on airplanes. Would you like to see my grandchildren? I feel like saying, no, I'm not interested at all. I mean, they just, they could, you could be showing me your rock collection as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. Uh, they just are strangers to me. That's what I feel like saying. Uh, but you hear people, you know, and, and, you know, this one's going to this school and this one's a cheerleader. And, the oh, usually they don't do that to me because I bury myself in my breviary. But uh, so, uh, so, or you can uh, show pictures of your home or other possessions and accomplishments. There's so many things you can brag about. Uh, another way that we show vainglory is by ostentation, and that is to act, to speak, or dress in such a way as to be singular or pompous. All right. So we said that to speak with an odd accent, to use words which your listeners would not understand. So big words, like Ratzinger, the, all of those modernists, referring to physical nature as the cosmos. The cosmos. Well, what is the cosmos? <laughs> or hermeneutic for interpretation. It's just the Greek word for interpretation. The Latin word is interpretation. And, you know, but the hermeneutic. It's the hermeneutic. See, that is sure sign of, of boasting vanity. You see, uh, so you, or speaking foreign languages in front of people uh, that cannot understand them. I mean, that, you, I know you speak Spanish. So far. That doesn't matter. It's just when you're in a group of people uh, and you're showing off that you can speak another language and nobody else can speak that language. You see, that, that's, that's ostentation. But if there's a reason to, because the person might understand more easily or it's just easier to speak in that language, that's not ostentation. Right. In short, to perform for others, for the purpose of obtaining their praise, their applause, or their attention. That's, that's it. And then the third is hypocrisy, which is the outward appearance of virtue to cover, cover up real vices. That's also a sign of vanity. The causes of vanity. St. John Chrysostom said, exterior vanity is a sure sign of interior poverty. All men have been created to possess God. That's the purpose of the creation of human beings, just like the purpose of the cre creation of the angels. 
to possess God, beatific vision. We are not like the animals who just live a life and then collapse and are eaten by ants. When they fail to possess God, they seek to fill in the void of their souls by the possession of petty goods. So you have to fill in that void by created goods, which are obviously nothing in comparison to the love of God, the grace of God, the beatific vision. Because the intellect and the will, I have to say this right, but in other words, they're made for a, to know truth in itself and the good in itself. So they are capable of being elevated to know those things. They are capable of being elevated to the beatific vision. St. Augustine said, our hearts were made for thee, and they will not rest except in thee. That's putting it you know, in a more eloquent way. In other words, that the, the human heart cannot be fulfilled by created goods. They are impoverished with regard to f fulfilling the human heart. You can tell uh, at Christmas time when, when kids get... Uh, Presence. Oh, oh, wonderful. Oh, the, oh, this is just exactly what I want. Oh, the one. And then in a week later, they're not interested in them anymore. They've worn out their usefulness and their ability to attract and to dazzle. And that's true of every created thing. That's why there's adultery, because the the wife is not interesting anymore and there's you know, some sort of beautiful thing in the office, which are known as office lizards, by the way, who look for married men and try to seduce them. And it often happens. A man seeks from all sides the glory which his conscience can no longer give him. See, no one can think of himself as an evil person. That's a general rule. If you are evil, if you do bad things, you have to do something in order to see yourself as a good person. So, for example, even mafia figures, you know, they, they see themselves as good people. You know, they, they uh, are, are charitable. They help the kids in the neighborhood. They help to keep order in the neighborhood. See, they have the esteem of people because they're nice and they're, you know, easy to get along with. They're popular. They give parties. But they're horrible people. I mean, they're monsters, but they have to somehow see themselves and be seen by others as good people. That's a drive in, in anyone that is a horrible person. So there's this void in them because their conscience is bothering them. Down deep, they know they're horrible. So this pressure of guilt is crushing. When a man sins gravely, therefore, he must deny the testimony of his conscience by means of a perpetual cover-up. And must seek from human beings a glory that he knows he will never receive from God. So they know they're going to hell. 
And so there's this drive to receive adulation and glory from others. And, th and so that, that drives vanity. Very much concerned about what people think about them. He therefore surrounds himself with sinful friends like himself. And then they engage in a mutual exchange of praise and applause. Those who live in this state of mortal sin must live off of vanity as their daily bread. See, so for example, when recently we had a sermon on purgatory at a funeral, these were all Novus Ordites, and it just smashed the vanity, you see, the, of all of those people that, that you're going to very possibly pay in purgatory for uh, sins that you committed in this life and for attachments th to created things that have not been expiated and so, and so forth. I mean, I didn't hear the sermon, but it's a usual purgatory sermon. Wow, it was terrible. You see, because you, you have invaded the, the conscience of people who are worldlings. It's very typical. But, uh, you know, as I always point out, when the Novus Ordo priest gets up and says, you know, whatever her name is, you know, Helen or something is, is making spaghetti in heaven and she's looking down on us and and you know and so forth uh, or else she's doing something else in heaven everybody's doing something in heaven you know uh, that's you see that that's wonderful you see and then you get the people the lay people the relatives they get up and they tell stories about the the deceased person and some of them are funny and you see but he was a wonderful person and then and then the casket is in white everything's white it's all alleluia and up they go and make spaghetti. See, that's very complimentary to worldly people. Uh, just like Bergoglio telling the little boy, your father, even though he was an atheist, you know, was a homo, bra homo bravo. So he was a good man. You see, that, that, that's that idea. You know, so he's nice, you know, he probably was you know, nice to everybody. They work at it. You see, they have to have that approval. So you go to heaven for being a great guy, Womo Bravo. It's Italian if you don't know that. Even venial vanity is a sign of a certain interior poverty of spirit. Now almost everybody's got some vanity. It is a sign of the excessive love of the world of attachment to human things. So it's something to constantly uh, check yourself on in your examination of conscience. You should examine your conscience every day. It doesn't take long. Right? It's not something, it might take a few minutes. It's most of the time the same old things, most of the time. It's just how many times you did it, that's all. But it's usually the same old things. <laughs> but you should, at night, you know, like at after Compline or something, do that. It's, it's common 
prescription for the spiritual life. So it is an attempt to draw from created things a happiness which they cannot give. It is a lack of wisdom and is the result of lukewarmness of charity, which is the next topic we're going to talk about. So th there's a healthy contempt of created things, no matter how nice they are. They're just a thing. And they come and they go. So you have to have that detachment. It's, it's one thing to use them. It's one thing to admire them, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, if they're admirable. But attachment is the problem. So be careful as a priest of the adulation of the lay people. Adulation is the enemy. And by that I don't mean you should be nasty to people who are telling you that you're a wonderful priest. All right? Just say thank you and move on. But you have to see that adulation as, as a dangerous thing because it can draw you into vanity. And many priests are, if not wrecked, they are, they are uh, impeded in their, the good that they do because of that. You don't want too, too much contact with lay people. You're... you're uh, position toward them is, is a, one of a professional, like a doctor or a, uh, any kind of professional. Uh, you're performing a service for them, and, and it's you know, a very personal service, but the, you, know, you should uh, it's, it's, yeah, and you should be nice, you should be friendly, you should, you know, you should not be like an ice, iceberg or anything like that, but you just have to watch um, how much you get involved in lay life. Don't become a lay person in a Roman collar, and I've seen that happen to priests because they get too involved with the lay people. Remedies to vanity. The first is humility. The realization by, that by ourselves we are nothing and that all of our perfections come from God and that the only thing which is truly ours is our sin, our infirmity, and our defects. Those are ours. Second, the stripping ourselves of the pomps of vanity. All habits are undone by performing actions contrary to them. So gluttony is undone by fasting. The habit of excessive drinking is also undone by not drinking at all. So alcoholics typically go completely off of it. So we must strip ourselves of those devices of vanity, that is, the manner in which we speak or wear our hair, right, or the manner in which we dress, the things that we talk about, subtle forms of boasting and so forth, which we already spoke about, all of those things. 
there's various ways that vanity comes out. It's 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 like the the roots of a tree. They they they're, they're, they go out in all sorts of ways. There's various ways in which to be vain. And you might be very humble in one thing, but vain in something else. You might be vain about the way you p play tennis, for example. <laughs> really, <laughs> third, <laughs> ridding ourselves of the obnoxious and loathsome vice of hip hypocrisy. Right, that's that is a so hypocrisy. It makes you want to look like one thing but be something else. A good example of hypocrisy is is the governor of California, who said, "Oh, you can't have any parties for Thanksgiving. Everybody's got to stay home. You know, you know, it's all locked down." And then he goes up to Napa Valley to an exclusive restaurant in Napa Valley. Napa Valley is like the land of the rich. It's the wine country. And has this party indoors, no masks, everybody, there's pictures of it, sitting around at a table, all packed together at a table, having a party. That's hypocrisy. That's known as hypocrisy. All right. Or the the representative from San Francisco. It looks like California has a lot of hypocrisy. The <laughs> where masks, 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 and she's you know seen in in a beauty. You can't go to the beauty parlor either. Only outside. She's inside with no mask on. All right. Pictures, and then she also wanted to call a party for the whole uh, Democratic uh, uh, you know. Um, well, every, all the congressmen of, of, of the Democratic Party, even though every, you, know, every, you can't have any parties and you can't have Thanksgiving and you can't have Christmas and all of these other things. That's known as hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. But there's many ways to be hypocritical. Uh, vain people might you know, do you know this solemn fasting at the table, and then later they eat in secret. That's hypocrisy. It's disgusting. It's it's a stinking, stinking. Uh, what 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 word are we going to put on it? Corruption or putrefaction or something. It's it's just a horrid thing when you see it, so avoid hypocrisy. <laughs>